one. Are you guys able to hear me? Hello, Luce. It's Friday, finally. <laughs> yes, it is Friday. Um, can you guys hear me pretty well? I'm in a different room today, so hopefully the microphone is okay. Um, oh my gosh, Jackie, you're going to be in China? That's so exciting. For how many weeks? Performing Kung Fu for two weeks. Oh, wow. That is very cool. Very, very cool. Okay. Let me try to get this situation station situated because it's two o'clock. Um, so we got to get started. Uh, display settings, swap, and then got to make sure I share my screen. It's been here before. Okay, are you guys able to see my screen? Yep, okay, perfect. So let's get started. Okay, so today we're going to be going over chapter 20, which is research study design. And we're also going to be going over chapter 16, which is quality concepts. Uh, we're going to we have two group member spotlights this week because I forgot to ask <laughs> last week. And then we're going to go over next week's assignments. So for this week, you had four chapters you had to read. Chapter 16, chapter 19, chapter 20, and chapter 33. Uh, today, we're only focusing on chapter 16 and 20. Please keep in mind that while I am focusing on specific chapters during our lessons, our group is really supplemental. So it's extremely important that you're getting your readings done and that you're taking notes um, because with the amount of time that we have uh, the information that I can cover in an hour is very limited um, especially with all of the information that's included in the APIC text so let's get started with chapter 20 which is research study designs now um, how many of you actually watch the USMLE step 1 epidemiology epidemiology principles video that I sent out uh, about two weeks ago it was about 17 minutes long and it just went over the different types of studies. Okay, so we have some of you who did watch it. Did you guys find that video helpful? I think that he does such an amazing job at really breaking everything down and explaining um, everything in a in a much better way than I ever could. I, I don't know, he just, he makes you understand things. Um, so if you haven't watched it, highly recommend it. Um, that And that's why it's here again. So good, good job, those of you who did watch it. So we have uh, different types of epidemiological studies. And so we're gonna focus right now on descriptive. So uh, choice of a study design should depend on the population available for study, the frequencies of exposures and outcomes in the population and the available data or participants. Descriptive studies are the simplest of observational studies. Um, they are basic quantitative terms, such as the number of occurrences of an outcome broken down as person, place, and time. They include case reports and case series as uh, data sources, and they do not include a control group for comparison. So these are really gonna be our simplest of observational studies. And here you can see that you have uh, the observational studies breaking down into descriptive studies and analytic studies. So analytical studies include cross-sectional, case control, and cohort studies, and they compare individuals with and without an outcome. For your exam, it's extremely important that you are able to differentiate specifically between cohort studies and case control studies. Cross-sectional studies are very easy to remember, but I feel that um, I feel that people get very confused between cohort and case control, and that's where they start missing points on the exam. So just making sure that you're understanding those concepts. So case control studies. They begin with the identification of individuals who have the outcome of interest, right? 
So case control is they have the outcome of interest. They select a control group without the outcome for comparison. After the case control status is defined, exposures are assessed and evaluated and more timely and less expensive than prospective cohort studies. And they're good for studying rare outcomes or outcomes that develop over a long time. So in this slide, there are things that you need to know and that you need to like, as soon as you hear them or you see them on a, que on a question, you need to be thinking, okay, so first things first, outcome. So you begin with individuals who have the outcome. That is the first thing that you need to remember. Also, they are good for studying rare outcomes, right? They're gonna ask you questions about if an Averis brand, if an event is rare, which type of study is better to utilize? Keep these things in mind, right? That it begins with the outcome and then after that, once that's already established, then you're looking at exposures. Then the exposures are assessed and evaluated, but this is after the status is defined. Whoa. That was a, a bad little circle there, but that's okay. So these are some key things you need to remember. So this is a case control example. So in September of 1993, an outbreak of Salmonella enteritis phage four occurred at a Chinese restaurant in El Paso, Texas. The case, the case control study was conducted to investigate the cause. Cases were people with diarrhea or culture confirmed Salmonella enteritis Enter, uh, this who ate at the restaurant between August 27th and September 15th. Controls were meal com companions of the cases without undue effects during the outbreak. The table shows the food reportedly consumed from the restaurant. So here we have our food items. There's breaded chicken, any chicken, egg rolls, and fried rice. And then we have the total number of cases and the total number of controls. So what do you guys think about this chart? What is what? What do you guys think about this? What What do you think could could possibly be the uh, the issue here? <laughs> oh, Michael Drennan says it's the egg rolls. <laughs> Okay, so let's look at what our our additional table uh, looks like. So which food item do you suspect is the source of the Salmonella enteritidis? And then you have your cases, your controls, your odds ratios, and uh, your p-value. So what do you think, which food item do you suspect is the source? <laughs> Egg rolls. Okay, so I'm gonna, Michael Drennan, I'm gonna go ahead and let me see if I can unmute your line uh, so that you can um, let us know why you chose the egg rolls. So, Michael, let's see. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, the, the reason I picked the egg rolls, just if you look at the cases and controls um, without doing the math, you want to look at, at least from my standpoint, I want to look at whatever food item had the highest difference between making people sick and those that didn't get sick. And if you look at this, more people that had egg rolls got sick than those who did not eat egg rolls mm -hmm. got sick without doing the math. Obviously, once you do the math, you get a better idea of what the what the impact is. Um, so I didn't know the exact number. It, it, that's a quick and dirty way to do it. I mean, fried rice <laughs> could have jumped out. Fried rice could have thrown a, you know, thrown a, um, uh, a wrench in that without doing the exact math, but the egg rolls were enough difference in the numbers that that's kind of what I felt was the issue. Great, great, great. No, so that that's great. Um, thank you so much. So additionally, you know, like what he mentioned, you just basically on what you're looking at um, without doing the math, but once you do the math and you're able to see this p-value, okay, so we know that um, the p-value becomes significant once it gets below 0.05, and then when we know our odds ratio, if it's greater than one, it's going to have an increase, right? So, so that's that's without doing the math, but now that we have the full chart, we're able to get a better picture. So thank you, Michael. That was great. That was great. Okay, so now cohort studies. Cohort studies are 
the groups are defined regarding their exposure to a factor of interest, right? So here we're dealing with the exposure first and not the outcome. So the key point is that the presence or absence of risk factor is determined before the outcome occurs. That's the biggest, real, really biggest difference is that you need to keep in mind for when you're taking this exam. Don't get confused. Make sure you review these slides, make sure you read the text, make sure you watch that YouTube video. Don't get these confused. Um, the goal is to assess whether the incidence of an event is related to a suspected exposure. The term cohort describes any designated group of persons who are followed or traced over a period of time. And a prospective cohort study considers, it's considered the gold standard because events can be recorded as they occur. But prospective cohort studies can be very expensive, right? So that's why a lot of times they may not be the ones that are chosen. Prospective studies are typically, they're going to be more expensive than retrospective studies, um, but specifically cohort studies, because you do have to do a lot of follow, a lot of following. Um, cohort data reflect the cause and effect temporal sequence of events. So here we have a timing of cohort studies or an example. It can either be prospective or retrospective, but you can see that you're always going to start with whether they were exposed or not exposed. Um, and so you're basically going to be classifying your exposed group or your not exposed groups into a good outcome or a bad outcome. Um, and in a retrospective cohort study, so if we start over here at this end, um, you're going to move that way. And with a prospective cohort study, you're moving this way. Okay. Once again, cohort studies, if you have not gotten the point here. We are dealing with people who were exposed, exposed, cohort studies. They are exposed, are exposed, are exposed group members. And then we have time passes, and then you compare the incidence of outcomes. Um, would this be an example of a prospective or retrospective cohort study, this picture that I have up here? Very good, Carrie. Yes, prospective. Okay. Now, cross-sectional studies, they are, these are, these are very easy to remember. Um, there's not as much involved, but they're still very important. So cross-sectional studies, they are common observational study designs. They provide, a, they provide a snapshot of a population. So you're kind of like taking a picture in time of a specific population in a specific place. Um, so there's assessment of disease and risk factors uh, that are performed at a point in time without follow-up. There's no follow-up. Cross-sectional studies use prevalent cases rather than incident cases. So with cross-sectional studies, you are not trying to identify the incidents, you are looking at the prevalence. When you do a point prevalence survey, that's a type of cross-sectional study. You are taking a snapshot in time of your facility, of what is going on with whatever pathogen you're looking for during that point prevalence survey. Uh, and it's generally used for hypothesis generation. And right here, once again, I have in red words, it's a snapshot. Exposure and outcomes are assessed at the exact same time. Now let's look at some case control versus cohort studies. This chart, this chart, if you can just know this chart well and understand it, you are well on your way of scoring well in any type of questions that they ask you. So uh, with case control studies, it starts with the diseased cases and not diseased. Uh, you determine if two groups differ in exposure and it's called a case control due to the way in which the study group is assembled. And it generally yields only an estimate of relative risk or odds ratio. With cohort study, it starts not with the disease but with the exposed and not exposed. And so, you know, case control, what they're really trying to say here is outcome. Um, I have to concentrate so much to write with this mouse. Goodness, okay, I apologize, guys. This is not my best artwork. But with the case control studies, you're focusing on the outcomes, and then with the cohort studies, the disease, or sorry, the exposed and not exposed. Uh, additionally, it's follow-up to determine differences in rates at which disease develop in relation to the exposure. It's called uh, so because the use of a cohort, quote unquote, it yields incidence rates, relative risks, and attributable risks. Now, they will have questions on the test about 
what kind of test is best for a rare exposure or a rare outcome? What kind of, um, what is going to be more expensive? A prospective cohort study or a retrospective uh, cohort study? They're gonna have different types of questions, right? Which one's more expensive? A case control, a cohort study, a cross-sectional study? And they may ask it like straightforward the way I'm asking you now, or they will find some convoluted way to make you question your life decisions and choices because that's what the test is basically uh, that's how it's created it, it makes it it makes you think and it makes you doubt what you know but just remember that you know what you know and don't let them trick you with their questions so with the cohort case control and cross-sectional study this is a criteria so for cost and time your cohort studies are going to be the most expensive especially your prospective cohort studies, case controls are low, cross-sectional studies are low. The number of subjects required for a cohort study, you need a large group. For a case control, you need a small group. And then for a cross-sectional study, you need a large group. So I'm not going to go through all of these, but this is a chart that will be really helpful for you, um, and especially if you get any of these questions wrong on the exam, because if you can go back and look at these charts and look at these slides, you, it will help you understand where you're going wrong in your in your way of thinking about these different types of um, these different types of uh, studies. So, question one. Uh, 1081 community dwelling Japanese, one, sorry, 1081 community dwelling Japanese individuals aged 60 and older without dementia had data available from a food frequency questionnaire in 1990 to identify dietary intake of potassium and calcium. After 17 years, 305 participants were identified from medical records as having dementia. The investigators reported findings that higher self reported dietary intakes of potassium and calcium reduced the risk for dementia. So uh, the first thing is frame the research question that likely supported the study. So what are they trying to find out with the information that you have? And then part two is what research study design was used to conduct this research. So let's deal with question one right now. What are they trying to find out? So Carrie Harder is saying, does dietary uh, intake of potassium and calcium reduce the risk of dementia disease? Does dietary intake in Japanese people 60 years and older affect the risk of developing dementia later in life? Exactly, very good. Yeah, you guys were able to to figure it out. Yeah, they're trying to find out the potassium and calcium and it's and the impact it could possibly have uh, when it comes to dealing with dementia. So based on the information that you have here, what research study design was used to conduct this research? So we have, everyone's saying cohort study. Uh, the majority of you are saying uh, retrospective. We did have some people say uh, prospective. So the correct answer is retrospective cohort study. Very good. Um, very good, you guys are, wow, everyone got this one mostly correct. Um, let me see who got it right first. Oh, goodness, everyone got it right. Um, mm, mm, mm. Jackie, Jackie Perez. All right, Jackie, I'm going to unmute your line so you can tell us how you walk through this to come to that conclusion. All right, Jackie. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, I chose cohort study because they are focusing on the, um, on the exposure. And it is retrospective because um, they had the information from the past. And okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, guys. So let's keep it moving. Question two, 
uh, Danish investigators undertook a blank study to evaluate the association between breast implants and connective tissue or other rheumatic disease. The study included women who had undergone breast implant surgery from 1964 through 1993 for cosmetic reasons or for reconstruction after breast cancer. Investigators collected data on the occurrence of connective tissue disorders following the implant surgery. Thus, the surgery and all of the outcomes under study had occurred by the time the investigators began the study. So we have multiple answer choices. Let's see which one's correct. All right, guys, so we have a lot of different answers. We have basically almost every answer chosen except uh, D. So let's see what the correct answer is. It's going to be a retrospective cohort study. So let me see who selected C. All right, Michelle Michaud was our first person who selected C. So let me see if I can unmute her line. Michelle? Hello. Hey. So I um, I saw that it was timed and it was back in time. It was going back. Mm -hmm. And then that it was a large group. So I just kind of took those two um those two pieces of information are, yeah very Can good we, yeah. thank you Which so much really easy. huh you make it really easy when you you know you explain it that way instead of i don't know i don't know what i was doing before but i can totally see it now oh okay <laughs> <laughs> thanks <laughs> So, yeah, so you see, and she didn't, you know, she didn't necessarily like, you know, utilize the entire chart and she was like, you know, oh, making a huge big deal about it. But she was able to utilize the knowledge that she has to come to a, a, a very good educational decision. And she was able to say, OK, well, I know it's not prospective. We know it's not cross sectional. We're dealing with the case control and a retrospective cohort study. And with the retrospective cohort study, we're looking at exposure, right? We're looking at breast implants, right? So and she was able to use she was able to use her her you know her knowledge that she has and it made sense. Okay. Question three: Surveys were mailed to every twentieth person listed in local in lo listed in a local telephone directory. Each person was asked to report age, sex drinking habits and breast cancer presence during the preceding week. Nearly 40% of the surveys were completed and returned. About 10% of women reported the presence of breast cancer overall. 15% of heavy drinkers reported breast cancer and 8% of teetotalers reported breast cancer. What's a teetotaler again? Are those the ones that drink a lot or that don't drink a lot? I cannot remember. Okay, so, uh, the question is, what research design was likely used to conduct this study? Okay, so we have everyone's putting cross-sectional. Very good, yes, it's a cross-sectional study design. We're looking at a snapshot 
of our situation here. So that makes sense. We got to keep it moving because it's close to it's getting close to. I, I, we have a lot more to cover. So let's do question four. So this is state whether or not a cohort study is best suited for each of the following scenarios. So whether or not a cohort study is best suited for each of the following scenarios. So A, when little is known about a rare exposure, yes or no? Cohort study, not case control, cohort. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, when little is known about a rare disease. No, correct. C, when the study population will be difficult to follow. Is a cohort study best suited when the population will be difficult to follow? Very good, guys. No. Now, is a cohort study best suited when you want to learn about multiple effects of an exposure? Great. Great, great, great. Everyone got that right. Okay. Uh, very good, guys. Now, question five, indicate whether the following statements are true or false. So we're just going to say, is A true or is it false? So A, a retrospective cohort study is more efficient than a prospective cohort study for studying diseases with a long, latent, and induction period. We have some trues, some falses. So that is true. B, cohort studies are the most sensible design for examining many exposures in relation to a single disease. Is that true or false? Is B true or false? Cohort studies are the most sensible design for examining many exposures in relation to a single disease. <laughs> this is kind of going back and forth. There's a lot of trues and falses for all of these. Uh, so C, the ideal comparison group for a cohort study would consist of exactly the same individuals in the exposed group had they not been exposed. The ideal comparison group for a cohort study would consist of exactly the same individuals in the exposed group had they not been exposed. <laughs> you can't choose both. You can't choose both answers. <laughs> so that is true. Yes, that is true. Right, we're we're assessing exposures, and we're going to want them to be have the same age, sim like the same age, sex. We're going to want those those groups to be uh, to to be similar, uh, or to be you know as close as possible to each other. Except one has been exposed and the other has not. All right, for D, uh, loss to follow up can be a problem in a cohort study, but not an ex but not an experimental study. Is that true or false? All right, guys, that is false. People go missing all the time in studies, right? Yeah, okay. Question six. Investigators enrolled 293 Parkinson's disease patients within three years of their diagnosis. They also enrolled 286 people without Parkinson's disease, matching the patients on age, race, and sex. 
Assessments of prior exposure to over-the-counter pain pills, such as ibuprofen, were made in all participants. The investigators found that the regular use of pain pills was markedly lower in persons with Parkinson's disease. What research design was likely used to conduct the study? Are you starting with the outcome or are you looking at the exposure? That right there should give you the answer. Case control study, because we are starting with the outcome. All right, beautiful people. Now it's time to get into chapter 16, quality concepts. This is our Harry Potter themed presentation for uh, the group. Um, I'm very excited, I love Harry Potter. Okay, so quality concepts are, are um, they're great, right? So if you if you are a quality person, you know, if you're a risk management person, quality and patient safety is your, you know, your main life hustle, then this chapter was probably very exciting for you to read through. However, for some of us, we do always, of course, care about patient safety, but quality concepts can be a little bit, um, um, they, they can just be a little bit, you know, you know what I'm trying to say. So let's go over some key concepts. So healthcare quality and improvement uses interdisciplinary teams to deploy changes and improvements. I think we can all, <laughs> Deborah Dice said, boring. Yes, that's what I was trying to say. <laughs> okay, so, um, you know, IPs have the responsibility of performing continuous quality improvement studies using systemic programs and tools and determining outcomes. So in our quality toolbox, we have a lot of different things that we can use. We can use a gap analysis, a root cause analysis, a failure mode effect analysis, all the analysis out there. You have control charts, you have checklists, you have guiding documents. Um, and so the way that I like to relate this, um, and I'm a big Harry Potter fan, so of course, you know, if you're a Harry Potter fan, then you're going to love this lesson. Uh, I look at it the way you use spells, right? So um, in Harry Potter, you use very specific spells to accomplish specific things. So for example, in the picture, Luna is using a Patronus charm, which she utilizes to basically protect herself from a Dementors. She wouldn't utilize a Patronus charm if she was trying to disarm someone else, right? So with this toolbox, you're gonna use your gap analysis for a very specific reason, for a very specific issue. Your root cause analysis, you're gonna use that for a very specific reason or for a very specific issue. All of these tools were developed for specific problems that you need to solve, okay? Now, performance improvement. Performance improvement is an ongoing continuous cycle that focuses on patient clinical outcomes, customer satisfaction, and service. That is a definition that you have to know. Put it on a note card, put it on your mirror. Uh, performance improvement is an ongoing continuous cycle that focuses on patient clinical outcomes, customer satisfaction, and service. What is an example of a performance improvement model? The PDSA cycle, the Plan, Do, Study, Act, which is the, the constant purpose towards change and is repeated. So that, that definition, you just got to know it. Now let's go over some basic principles of quality concepts. So in 1960, 1996, the Institute of Medicine launched a concerted effort to improve the nation's healthcare quality. And they published two very big, um, two very big, uh, studies or papers, books, I cannot remember exactly what it was, but in 1999, it was to err as human, and in 2001, it was crossing the quality ch chasm. So to err as human, um, it focused on building a safer health system. It focused on the number of Americans who die each year because of medical errors, and it discussed six aims of care, safety, effectiveness, patient-centeredness, timeliness, efficiency, and equity, right? So to err as human, focus on medical errors. 2% of all deaths are due to preventable medical errors. Um, now that seems like a small percentage, but I mean, if you're part of that 2%, I can only imagine how that would feel. Uh, so robust performance improvement programs measure how a facility or organization controls or performs root cause analysis. It reports individual physician or unit rates and benchmarks. Um, the and, it, and benchmarks the organization's infection rate against community, state, and national averages. So let's let's 
learn a little bit more about crossing the quality chasm that was published in 2001. It urgently calls for changes to healthcare process to improve quality of care, and it set up a framework for healthcare quality improvement. It also brings importance of patient and family-centered healthcare to the front line. So let's go over a strategic plan, and you know this is this is based straight out of your chapter 16 quality concepts. So your strategic plan determines the direction and organization, the direction and organization will go in the future and what the organization must do in order to reach the goal, mission or vision that they have, right? And that's why you have these little beautiful puzzle pieces here talking about your mission, the vision, your values, and that strategy that's gonna help you um, achieve that. So the strategic plan steps uh, include an analysis of the organization, forming conclusions about what an organization must do as a result of issues facing the organization, and action planning. You also have performance improvement teams. These are multidisciplinary teams that are a valuable tool in deploying a quality-focused culture or process. So a project team or committee is composed of subject matter experts who do the work. So that would be like an example would be your infection control committees. You guys are focusing, yes, on infections, but also how you can improve you know, your healthcare culture and how you can lower your infection rates. And infection control committees per APIC guidelines should be, compo should be composed of a variety of people, including, of course, your infection preventionist, but also your, your EVS um, staff, your, yes, your EVS leaders, but also staff. You want to make sure that you're getting a lot of different input. Um, you have nurses, you have physicians, you have the pharmacy. It, it, it's supposed to compose a multidisciplinary um, team, okay? Senior leadership support is key. So teams prove effective and accomplished work with the support of senior organizational leaders and managers. Senior leadership creates the quality culture and requires team members to report and discuss their valuable learning experience. And I think that's something that they do point out a lot in your APIC text is the importance of having leadership involved. You know, a lot of the time we aren't those people at the top um, that are that are in, you know, leading a lot of these infection control initiatives in healthcare facilities and in local health departments, um, but making sure that we are having that, that leadership support is very important. So gap analysis. Um, so the description of the gap analysis is, it's a tech, technique used, technique, Bendito. Technique used to compare best practices with the current process and determine the steps to take to move from a current state to a desired future state. So you're looking at what is the situation station right now? What do I want it to be in the future? And let's look at the, those gaps, right? And so that's why I have Professor Trelawney here with a crystal ball because you're trying to get to a future state. And if you watch Harry Potter, you know Dr. You know Professor Trelawney, she's the, the divination teacher, so I love her. Um, use your inner eye to see the future. So the gap analysis, you're looking at what is, what it should be, and then you're identifying those gaps. That is a gap analysis. So when you are taking the test, remember the picture of Professor Trelawney with her um, crystal ball. Now let's talk about the root cause analysis. Now there are some Prisoner of Azkaban spoilers. If you have not seen the movie at this point in your life, you're late, so I do not feel bad. Um, so the description of the root cause analysis is that it takes a retrospective look. Retrospective, we are going back in time. It's taking a retrospective look at adverse outcomes and determines what has happened why it happened, and what an organization can do to prevent the situation from recurring. Information collection is through structured interviews, document reviews, and field observations. Root cause analysis are extremely time consuming and they are costly. And so here, the, the pictures that I chose to represent a root cause analysis is when uh, Hermione and, um, and Harry are basically going back in time to try to uh, realize okay what happened what what why was buckbeak killed right they're going back in time and really trying to figure out how they can prevent the situation from recurring and so one of my favorite quotes from the movie um is is this one right down here i'm not going to say it because i love emma watson and i can't do her english accent so 
the root cause analysis process. You have risk managers and patient safety experts. They use the root cause, an root cause analysis widely to investigate major incidents, sentinel events, or errors in healthcare delivery. The RCA process avoids individual blame, and it considers human factor engineering and analyzes redesign for a safer system. So here we have um, the, basically what they're looking at. They're looking at human and other factors, the process or system involved, the underlying causes and effects of the process, the risk and potential contributions to failure. So that's all part of what that team that's going to be conducting all of those interviews. Um, and structured interviews, document reviews, and field observations, these are the things they're going to be looking at, these four different factors. So what are some of the limitations? of the root cause analysis. So the team must delve deep enough into the adverse cause of the problem in order to determine what the appropriate process change needs to be. So I mean this is like a deep dive like you really got to you really got to get in there to try to figure out what happened. And that's why I have this picture down here of this uh of the scene from Harry Potter where in order to get a very specific memory it took Harry a lot of work, a lot of time in order to be able to get down to oh my goodness, this is the reason why this happened. It was because of this certain conversation that took place. And that's where I'm tying that in, right? So you need to dive deep, deep enough into the adverse cause of the problem in order to determine the process change. Um, the like I said, a root cause analysis may be expensive, time consuming and labor intensive. And then lastly, team members may require training on the techniques, goals and outcomes before participating in a root cause analysis. Tanya said, good thing I just watched this movie. <laughs> Tanya, yes, proud of you. Um, okay, so here we have a fishbone or Ishikawa diagram. Um, when, you, when you see fishbone or Ishikawa diagram and you are taking your test immediately, you don't even need to think about it. You should already be thinking in your head, root cause analysis. It should be like, like, like a light switch. Fishbone or Ishikawa diagram, you're thinking of a root cause analysis. So here, our example is you're trying to figure out why Sirius was unfairly convicted of Wormtail's murder. And that is the problem. That is the problem that occurred, right? That is the problem that occurred in this movie. But in real life, right, in real life, it could be that one of your patients died because of a clabsy or a cotty. Um, you know, you're not necessarily going to do an entire fishbone diagram for this. You could, right? But but it's an example of, of what a problem would be. And then you're going back, right? And you're looking at the equipment, the process, the people, the materials, the environment, your management. These are all the factors that could have contributed to this mistake, to this problem, to this for this error to occur, right? And we don't want it to happen again, which is why they're using which is why they're using this fishbone diagram. Now, at the conclusion of the root cause analysis, a team summarizes and identifies causes and causes and begins to strategize about process redesign. The root cause analysis serves as a formal structure to learn from past mistakes. Now, with a root cause analysis, basically it's going to come in six flavors, right? And so you're going to have basically it's going to split off into two different um, categories. It's either going to be that the error occur because of procedures and, or standards or people. So on your procedures and standard size, um, either your facility has no procedures, you have poor procedures written out, right, standard operating procedures, or you have well-written procedures but they're out of date. These are some of the things that could have caused that error, that sentinel event, that adverse event to, to occur. Now as far as people go, either your people are poorly trained, they had no training at all, they were just kind of fed to the wolves and expected to know what to do. Um, or the people were trained, but chose not to follow the procedure. And now this is something that we stress a lot during our infection control assessments. It is not enough to train people. You cannot expect that you, you train someone and then they know exactly what to do. Follow up and competency validation is extremely important in healthcare. If you say, yes, our environmental staff are trained in how to clean a room, but then I come into your facility and every single person in your EVS team starts cleaning the room in different locations and it is not systematic and it is not organized, yes, your staff may have been trained, but they were not, their competency was not validated. So it's very important that after training, follow-up needs to be done to reinforce 
the information and ensure that employees are following proper procedures, right? It's extremely, extremely, extremely important. Um, so basically what I'm trying to say is, yes, you can do a root cause analysis, but at the end of the day, it's gonna come down to one of these six flavors. Um, and at the bottom here, it's one of these things that, that is gonna have caused the problem. Now the failure mode effect analysis, um, I'm not going to go through through this presentation. You guys will need to watch it on your own time, but but it is a proactive preventative approach to identify potential opportunities for error. So this is something that you would utilize before an error occurs. So this is you trying to assess what you can improve. It is it, it would be classified under primary prevention because you are implementing a failure mode effect analysis before any problems occur. Um, we don't have enough time to watch that video because we only have 15 minutes left. Now let's look at our SWOT analysis. So here we have our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis. Um, you may have done these before. You may have worked, you know, you may have had to do this exercise. Maybe your quality people had you go through one of these. Uh, we went through one of these. Um, so some of you guys may be familiar, but they're utilized to investigate public health issues and improve healthcare outcomes. And conducting this type of analysis points out what the organization should plan for and how to use resources and guide efforts within a formal framework. So it's basically composed of your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats. So strengths are going to be what advantages does this, this organization um, have or offer? Right, so in the example of Slytherin, some advantages is that these are, this is a house of, full of really ambitious people. They also have a strong network of evil wizards. So if you are trying to, you know, become a Death Eater or if you're, if that's the kind of, you know, path you want to take in life, then you have a strong network. So that would be a strength. Now a weakness is what could improve? What could we make better? Uh, what, should the what should the organization or program avoid? So some of the weaknesses would be that, you know, these people can be a little bit mean. They're bullies. They need to be a little bit more kind. Um, and, you know, I'm really breaking it down to just basics um, because there could be so many different quality issues that we could plug into this, but then it wouldn't be as fun. Um, opportunities is what can the organization do to minimize the loss and improve performance, right? Uh, so perfect recruitment pool for death eaters. That would be an opportunity. And then um, our threats are what obstacles will the program or organization face and what changes threaten the program? So those are some of the key questions that you're going to be asking yourself when you're conducting a SWOT analysis. Now, multi-voting. This one's really easy. Um, if you can just remember this image down here, it will be very easy for you to be able to, to visualize it. So in multi-voting, the process of prioritizing a large list of topics to a final selection for performance improvement is utilized. So team members basically vote or rank their selection in order of priority. And after votes are tallied, they decide on which project they will work on. So they can, this can happen only once where you do multi-voting once or it can, you can do it multiple times so that you can really get down to one or two options. Now, goal-directed checklists. Um, so checklists have been used in aviation for more than 60 years and you can imagine why. I mean, just, just looking at, at, at this, this airplane gives me anxiety. Like I can't, I don't know how they do it. Um, so aviation uses checklists to ensure pilots complete the most basic steps for securing capacity for complex cognitive action. And by applying checklists to the prevention of infection within an organization and using simple steps, such as washing your hands and cleaning the skin with an antiseptic, organizations can really eliminate hazards and problems that affect patients every day. So an example of a, of a checklist would be a surgical site infection prevention checklist. So here we have, this one's from the Joint Commission and, it, and it's telling you antimicrobial prophylaxis, was it performed? Yes or no. The time the antibiotic was was administered, the time it was re-administered. So it, it, it goes through an entire list, a checklist to help you prevent a, a surgical site infection. Now run charts. Run charts are used to identify how processes change over time. Uh, and they allow for the mean or average to be determined and show the changes in the in the mean and average, right? Run charts also demonstrate special cause variation when there is a steady pattern of observations points falling above or below the mean average line in an equal pattern, right? 
So here we have basically the stretch goal, um, your infection rate over here, and then your medium, your median, sorry. And you can see if you're going above the median, then that is that is not good because it's the infection rate. You want to make sure that your infection rate is staying low and that's where you have the happy face. I didn't have any questions on my exam where they specifically, you know, had a run chart or had me look at it, um, but, but you may. So that's why we're putting them here. The affinity diagrams, this is when you're going to gather large amount of language data and creatively group the data based on lines of natural relationships. So you can see here we have all of these little sticky notes and all of these are uh, all is all of this data and then we're going to break it up into little sections like, oh, well, this is part of quality. This is part of service. This is part of the delivery. This is part of price. So that's kind of how um, an affinity diagram works. Now Pareto charts. I have some very strong feelings about Pareto charts. I think Pareto charts are very good. They are very cool. Um, uh, they are they are probably one of my favorite types of charts. Um, so these are a series of vertical charts arranged and sorted in descending order of height from left to right with a cumulative percentage line on the y-axis. This looks a little busy, but if you know how to read it, it makes a lot of sense to you. Pareto charts will allow a team to identify where their efforts will produce the greatest value, implying that 80% of the benefits will stem from 20% of the causes. So in this Pareto chart, we're looking at types of medication errors. So our types of medication errors are going to be caused by a variety of different things, like our doses are missed, they're administered at the wrong time, it's the wrong drug. Uh, and then there's an overdose, the wrong patient. So these are all of the different types of issues that could lead to a medic, or these are all the different types of medication errors that are happening in your facility. And this over here is the frequency. So how often are they happening? So what this is basically telling you is, all of these different types of medical errors are rabbits that you need to catch and that you need to figure out. Now, you want to focus on what's going to give you the biggest bang for your buck. If you go off chasing for all of these seven or 12 rabbits, right, all at the same time, you're probably not going to catch the rabbit that you need to catch because it's a hot mess express. You need to focus your efforts on what is really gonna give you the most benefits. What is gonna give you the most benefits? These right here, right? These right here. If you focus on the vital few, on the doses that are being missed, on the fact that it's being administered at the wrong time, you're gonna have a reduction of on your medical errors. If you focus on unauthorized drugs or technique error or wrong IV rate or underdose, that's not really going to have a huge impact on your medication errors and I hope that that makes sense. Now let's do a quick concept check. Um, so a line graph shows how long an issue has existed. Now I know you're thinking Luz you haven't talked about line graphs. Well it was in the chapter so mm, 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 don't want to hear it. So question number one, a line graph shows how long an issue has existed. True or false? Okay. The correct answer is true. A line graph does show how long an issue has existed. Next is the Pareto chart is used to prioritize opportunities for improvement. True or false? Hmm. Really think about this one. Are you going to be prioritizing things with a Pareto chart? Is a, is a Pareto chart going to be able to give you what you need to focus on, what you need to prioritize on in order to have the best improvements? It is. Yeah, it is. Remember, we have, we have our Pareto charts that are going to tell us what we need to focus on. Um, the next question is, the Pareto charts can be used to show many different views of a given data set. True or false? Mm -hmm. I can see you guys are not super comfortable with these concepts because not a lot of you are answering. <laughs> it's okay. 
<laughs> That's all right. That's why we're going through it. So true, yes, you can display information or the data that you're given in, in very different ways utilizing a Pareto chart. Um, now for the Pareto analysis, data should be collected for analysis considering which of the following. So for this one, you're gonna wanna focus on who, on where, what, and when, right? Pareto chart uh, is not really gonna help you um, analyze the why, right? That would be more of our fishbone diagram um, rather than a Pareto chart. Now let's match the letters with the graph or chart. So our two options are a line graph or a Pareto chart. So for A, a significant problem, would you utilize a line graph or a Pareto chart? Squeeze me. Okay. So we have some people saying a Pareto. We have some people saying a line graph. A significant problem. It's going to be a Pareto chart. Correct. Uh, what about trends? If you're trying to look at trends, are you going to use a line graph or a Pareto chart? You guys knew that one right away. Yep, it's going to be a line graph. Now, a cumulative percentage. It was mentioned briefly, but a cumulative percentage, where will you find that? Pareto, very good. Uh, what about a gap? If you're trying to identify gaps, will that will a, will a line graph help you identify gaps, or will a Pareto? It's going to be a line graph. A line graph is a line graph is going to help you identify some gaps. And then the 80/20 rule, of course, which we discussed, is going to be your Pareto. Now the six sig the six sigma and the lean approach we got to move got to keep it moving. Um, I don't think we're going to have time to go through everything today, but uh, that's okay. Um, actually, let's just go to the questions right now because I still need to do my group member spotlight. We just we just missed the six sigma lean approach. Um, let me just. So the primary focus for the Six Sigma and Lean approach is you really want to minimize process variation, which produces defects. So this was started um, in um, engineering with Toyota. So they wanted to reduce the variation. So here you see you have variation um, and defects. So the more variation that you have, the, the worse the outcome is going to be. But once you're able to reduce that variation and get it down to an average, the better it's going to be. So in healthcare, if you can reduce the variation in which your nurse are inserting Foley catheters or or are you know the variation in which they're providing care uh, you know Foley care or you know central line care that's gonna be a better outcome for your patients because you're really reducing that variation and you're ensuring that everyone's kind of doing all of the same things right so I hope that makes sense and now let's do some questions we may go over by like five minutes um, but Hopefully you guys can be okay with that. So question one, which of the following refers to patient harm that is the result of treatment by the healthcare system rather than from the health condition of the patient? A, an adverse event, B, a dire consequence, C, an unanticipated event, and D, a sentinel event. Okay, so which of the following refers to patient harm that is the result of treatment by the healthcare system rather than from the health condition of the patient? That is going to be an adverse event. Okay. Now, question two. The Director of, of Infection Prevention and Control is leading a process improvement project to decrease the rate of CLABSIs in one of the hospital hospitals ICUs. The multidisciplinary team has discussed multiple process improvement strategies to decrease these bloodstream infections. In developing the final improvement plan, which of the choices below is most likely to help decrease the rates of these infections? A, performing a gap analysis each month, B, 
B, performing a failure mode effect analysis immediately. C, incorporating the use of a collapsing bundle and a checklist to ensure that, that all aspects of the plan are followed. Or D, perform a SWOT analysis. Okay, so the correct answer is going to be incorporating the use of a Clavsy bundle and a checklist to ensure that all aspects of the plan are followed, right? So by this point, they've put together a multidisciplinary team and they've discussed multiple process improvement strategies to decrease, right, these bloodstream infections. So they've already developed a plan. Um, performing a SWOT analysis wouldn't really, um, that would, you can, you can cross that one out. Uh, performing a failure mode effect analysis immediately. This is really for preventative um, actions. You've already identified you have a problem. You're really trying to get down to the bottom of it and to decrease those rates. A failure mode effect analysis is not gonna help you in this scenario. So really it should have been down to A and C between these two and incorporating the use of a Clabsy bundle and checklist to ensure that all aspects of the plan are followed is going to really be the best option out of the two. Now in question three, sorry, question three. In 1997, the Joint Commission on, on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations mandated the use of root cause analysis to um, A, document instances of medical malpractice, B, predict the occurrence of an incident, C, improve staffing issues, and D, investigate sentinel events in accredited hospitals. Hmm. Interesting. So, guys, come on. You should be thinking root cause analysis. That should be your key. So what is a sentinel event? A sentinel event is defined by the Joint Commission as any unanticipated event in a healthcare setting resulting in death or serious or physical or psychological injury to a patient or patients that is not related to the natural course of the patient's illness. Sentinel events specifically include loss of limb or gross motor function and any event for which a recurrence could carry a risk of serious adverse outcome. Sentinel events are identified under the Joint Commission accreditation policies to help aid in root cause analysis and to assist in the development of preventative issues. So the correct answer is D. All right, question four. The purpose of a root cause analysis is to, I'm not going to read all of those, so which one is the best answer? Okay, sorry, I'm, I wanna make sure I give you guys enough time. All right, so the correct answer is gonna to be to include participants from diverse areas of the organization to delve into the cause of an error or system failure and identify changes in practice in our policy that will prevent a repeat and ever, an error. First of all, they do not focus on individual blame. That is one thing that they do not do when you do a root cause analysis. So A, you should have crossed out immediately. 
Um, review the basic process that are in place and then turn that review over to a unit specific team so they can determine how they should modify their practices. This is not an example of a root cause analysis. Um, provide a process that requires little time or training but allows employees to identify culpability. Once again, culpability, they are not focusing on blaming an individual. A, B, and C are incorrect um, if you know what a root cause analysis is. So even if you just know what it is, that would have led you to the correct answer, which is D. Question five, after reviewing the quarterly report, the manager of the adult ICU contacts the IP for assistance to create a plan to reduce central line infections. Which of the following should the IP recommend? Wait for the next report to see if the rate has decreased. B, create an intravascular team. C, develop a multidisciplinary team to review and implement best practices. Or D, send a referral to medical affairs for peer review. Okay, so after reviewing a quarterly report, a manager is coming to you and basically telling you, hey, we need to come up with a plan to reduce these central line infections. And your, your, your recommendation to him is gonna be, uh, let's wait for the next report to see if the rate has decreased. Uh, no, you would not do that. That that is putting patients at risk. That is not uh, no false. Just don't even just a cannot be the answer. Create an intervascular team. Ah, uh, this could work quite possibly. Develop a multinary multidisciplinary team to review and implement best practices. That sounds like a good possibility. Send a referral to medical affairs for peer review. What? No. Okay, so we know a and D are absolutely not the correct answers. We're down to B and C. Now here's the issue. The issue is that we don't know what is causing these central line infections, right? It could be the central line care. It could be that you know nurses are not utilizing the right dressings. It could be that they're not cleaning the hubcap. So creating an intravascular team is jumping the gun. Like you are not really sure that that's what you need. So what you need to do first is you need to develop a multidisciplinary team to review and implement the best practices, right? And I hope that makes sense. Question six, uh, the director of the infection prevention and control department has assigned one of her IPs to co-facilitate co in a root cause analysis of an adverse event in collaboration with the performance improvement team. The IP plans to use process improvement tools and techniques during the analysis. Which of the following methods would best outline the possible causes of the event? Now you shouldn't, you shouldn't even be thinking about this one. This one, you should already know <laughs> because I told you guys, if you see root cause analysis, you should immediately be thinking of two words, which are fishbone diagram and Ishikawa diagram. So yes, the correct answer is C. Okay, so let's go over our group member spotlights. So one of our group member spotlights for today is going to be Ms. Frances Vaughn from Seminole County. She is a proud mama of two. Um, these are her two baby boys here and they are a lot. And I know because I'm on the phone with her all the time when they're in the background being crazy, um, but they do a lot and she loves them very much. So all of her hobbies are their hobbies. Um, so, you know, they do a lot of different activities. They have swimming lessons, they have they do track, um, and they also take piano lessons. So she is a very busy, busy mama bear. Um, she got her bachelor's from UCF in medical laboratory sciences. So she actually previously used to work in the lab, in the lab. So she has a lot of really good laboratory knowledge, which will be extremely helpful for her um, in this exam. And then she got her MPH from FAMU. So that is my beautiful best friend, Francis. Now, our second group member spotlight is Ms. Angela Armstrong from Collier County. Uh, she, in 2015, she graduated with a, both a Bachelor of Science in Biomedical Sciences in Public Health. Uh, she, yeah, you go girl. Mm, that is wonderful because I do not like chemistry, so good for you. Uh, in 2017, she got her MPH in Global Communicable Diseases and Epidemiology. Once again, she is a total queen because not only did she do a master's, she basically did a dual degree in two different concentrations. So she's 
she's a smart cookie. Uh, her hobbies are yoga, painting, and longboarding with her pup, Raiden. This is her puppy right here. I love dogs. Um, so her fur baby is Raiden. She, um, he was rescued from the Humane Society of Tampa Bay 4.5 years ago, and she really loves him a whole lot. Uh, she also volunteers, so she's got a kind heart. Uh, she volunteers on the weekends at the local Humane Society, so that is wonderful. And then this is a picture of her and her mama at her MPH graduation in 2017. Now our week seven assignments, you have homework. Um, I really need you guys to get your practice questions done for module two. You need to submit those by uh, Wednesday, uh, October 17th at 11.45 p.m. Um, and this is just to really assess how well you did in this in this module so just make sure you get that done this page is going to be on page seven of your uh, cic study plan and workbook and then your assigned readings are going to be chapters 5 34 and 120. Um, so that is it for today i hope you guys had a wonderful time today um, i know we went over but you know what it's going to be okay because we learned a lot today so i hope that you guys found this helpful today and thank you so much for joining me once again guys i will see everyone next week okay all right goodbye everybody yes you guys too you guys have a great weekend i i can never figure out how to get out of here uh oh, where is the thing Yes.